Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we are in chapter 11. Uh, this is the longest chapter. There's the most amount of sections, um, I believe 10. And um, this is a, a big change from what we've been doing in uh, second semester calculus here. Um, we are now gonna be breaking things down into what are called discrete functions, meaning we're gonna be dealing with sequences and eventually series, which we'll get into in another video. Um, a sequence is a list of numbers that has an order uh, of some sort. Um, the notation that we use is here. And um, we could have an infinite uh, sequence or we could have a finite one. We could also write it like this. And sometimes we can write it like this. And we know it's an infinite if we have dot, dot, dot at the end, like this first example will be an infinite. And um, what we're gonna start out doing is trying to see what the pattern is for this sequence. And the way this is gonna work is our first term we're gonna label a sub one. Second term is a sub two, a sub three, a sub four, and so on. And um, when we generalize it, we use a letter. Um, you, we tend to use i, j, k, or n um, as our counter numbers. Um, in this class, uh, we will mostly be using n's or k's. Now, I wanna take a look at a sub one and identify that three over five can be rewritten as five to the first power and one plus two. Just for example, the reason I'm showing that is because we're gonna see a pattern here that's going to be similar. Now here we have the negative to deal with. And you'll notice that this alternates positive, negative, positive, negative. We actually have a name for that. It's called an alternating sequence. Uh, we'll talk more about that in another section, but we will need to address it. This four is actually two plus two, and this is actually five squared. And again, we'll deal with the negative here in just a moment. A sub three is a positive five, over 125. We can call this three plus two, and this is five to the third. So what we're trying to do is establish a pattern here. I'm really trying hard to use the counter that we have down here. So that one's negative again, six over 625. And I'll notice that this is four plus two, and that this is five to the fourth power. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with a generalization for the nth term. So I'm gonna deal with the negative now. I'm gonna notice that the first term is a positive one. The way we typically do the negatives is we have a negative one, we're gonna raise that to the n power or the n plus one power or n minus one power. Um, because it needs to be positive, I'm gonna raise it to the n, but when n equals one, negative one to the first power is negative, and that's not negative, that's positive. So I'm gonna call that n plus one. This is a common trick we'll be using throughout the semester, or throughout the rest of this chapter, I should say. Now up top, I'm gonna to notice that it's the counter number plus two, counter number plus two, counter number plus two, counter number plus two. So we're gonna call that n plus two over, and it looks like we have five to the counter number, five to the first, five to the second, five to the third and fourth and so on. So this is gonna be five to the n power. And this is our sequence. Uh, again, that negative one to the uh, n or n plus one power is uh, a common trick that we have. This next one is a little bit more simple. It's looking like the denominator is going up by two each time. And it's going to start with, yeah, here. So I'm gonna view this, I'll break it down like I did before. This is 
two times one, this is two times two, two times three, two times four, and so on. And I'm noticing that my sequence in this case, sorry, let's start again. This denominator here is two times one, two times two, two times three, two times four. So it looks like it's two times the counter number. And the numerator is always one. There's a nice simple one for us. So when I plug in one, I get one half, which I should get. When I plug in two, I get one over four. Three, a sub three is gonna be one over two times three, which is six and so on. So once again, here's our formula for the a sub n term. All right, for this next one, we have an alternating sequence again. And we're starting up positive, so I'm guessing we're gonna have a negative one to the n plus one, like we did before. And let's see if we can see what the pattern here is. It's looking like the numerators are perfect squares. That's one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared. And the denominators, it looks like we're adding one. Plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, and so on. So a sub n is going to be, let's have one to the n plus one again. Now it's plus one because, again, when n equals one, that's going to go one plus one, which is two, and negative one squared is a positive, which my first term needs to be positive. I'm going to also notice in the numerator, it's going to be the counter number squared. So when n equals one, one squared is one. When the counter number is two, two squared is four, and so on. And in the bottom, it's looking like when n equals one, one plus one is two. There's my first one. When n equals two, two plus one is three, and so on. It takes a little bit of practice to, to kind of see these, but hopefully these examples will be helpful for you. All right, let's move on to the next page. All right, we've got a few definitions here, a few things. Um, we're gonna talk about a limit. Now, we are now using what are called, like I said, discrete functions. So far, we're used to continuous functions where we have a nice smooth curve and it's doing its thing. What we're looking at now are literally dots because n equals one, two, three, four, five. So we're not getting like all the numbers between one and two and so on. So a sequence, a sub n, has a limit and we write that the limit as n goes to infinity is L. And we could also write it with the arrow notation. This means the same thing. Now, if the limit exists, then we said the sequence converges. We're going to have to get use these two words quite a bit for this last chapter. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges. Now, converges means that the limit goes to a specific number, one specific number. If it goes to, say, plus or minus five, that's not one specific number, that's two specific numbers. So that we would say that that diverges. Also, if it goes to infinity or negative infinity, we also say that it diverges because infinity and negative infinity are definitely not uh, one specific number. So for this one, it would be like the limit goes to seven or pi or e to the fourth or something like that, any specific number. And we have our limit laws for sequences. They're pretty much the same as the limit laws for continuous functions. So when we're adding or subtracting, we can break them up into two separate limits. When we have a constant, we can factor the constant out. And the reason being that the constant itself doesn't have an n with it, so it's not going to be affected by the limit. When we're multiplying, we can break it up. And when we're dividing, we can break it up as well. Um, we could even bring uh, with this here, we can bring the limit into the actual sequence itself, seen as p is unaffected by n. And we have the squeeze theorem for sequences. And that's saying when we have a function, a discrete function in this case, between, that's all, all of their terms are always between or equal to two other functions. And the limit for a sub n is the same as the limit as c sub n, they both go to L, then for sure, the middle function has to converge also to L. And so if this limit goes to zero, then we can say that uh, without the absolute value, it also goes to zero. 
because it's not going to matter whether it's, it's positive or not. All right, let us start taking some limits here. Now, a classic way to do this is to multiply. Now, by the way, notice that this goes to infinity over infinity, and th this is an important thing to distinguish. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, L'Hopital's rule? Um, yes and no. Um, we will get to L'Hopital's rule. Um, the problem that uh, we hesitate with that is because these are discrete functions, and to take a derivative, we need continuous functions. But we'll come to that, don't worry. So because it's one of our indeterminate forms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom. Let me rewrite it. I'm going to multiply the top and bottom both by one over n. This is a trick we learned earlier uh, in, in Calc 1, actually. So this gives us this. Very nicely, hopefully we remember, this limit goes to zero. Remember as the denominator gets really, really large, the whole function goes to zero. And that leaves us with one over one or just one. And we would say that, that this converges to one. All right. Is the sequence convergent or divergent? Now I'm going to do a little trick here. I'm going to pull in the denominator. I'm going to factor an n out. Notice when I distribute that back in, I'm back to here. And then I'm going to further rewrite this like this. Why would I do all that? Let me show you. Uh, one other quick fact we need to remember is that n divided by root n. Remember, you subtract the exponents, that's 1 minus 1 half. This gives, becomes root n. So why am I doing that? Well, we're gonna take the limit as n goes to infinity of n over square root of n, uh, 10 plus n. And I'm gonna rewrite it like I did here. like that, like I did over here. I'm now gonna use this rule to reduce that. That's gonna give me root n up top from here, n over root n, over square root of 10 over n plus one. Now, I didn't mention it, but if you, do take this limit, you do get infinity over infinity. So that means it's indeterminate, which means we don't know. Now, I, what I do know is as I do this limit, that goes to zero. So the whole denominator just becomes one because root one is one. And up top, we end up with infinity over one, which is infinity. So we would say that this diverges, meaning way out infinity, we're not getting closer and closer to any specific number. All right, moving on. So 
is the sequence a sub n the square root here convergent or divergent if it's convergent find the limit well i'm going to notice for sure i'm going to get infinity over infinity again i'm going to use the trick that i just learned And I'm going to factor out an n squared from under the radical. In both the top and the bottom. And we're all under one radical, so these actually reduce out. And these go to zero. So this limit becomes root four over one. You know, if I break it up, either way, the limit is two and it's convergent. It went to one specific number. All right, uh, number seven is somewhat of a game changer here. Let's see that up. First off, notice that I'm going to get infinity over infinity. So let's do L'Hopital's, but we have to be extra careful. I need to do this. It's a discrete function, which means I can't take the derivative, but I'm going to use the function f of x as the ln of x, a continuous function, over x, which is a continuous function. This I can take the limit of. And the nice thing is, whatever this limit goes to, the discrete one is also going to go to. So we're going to do this. We've got to change it to a continuous function. of ln x over x. And now we can apply L'Hopital's. Uh, this is now x goes to infinity, x goes to infinity. And this is going to give me one over x over one. That goes to zero. So this becomes zero over one, which is zero. Therefore, limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n over n, it's also zero, which is convergent. And you might think, why is zero convergent? Again, it's one specific number. Some people use zero and um, in a confusing way where, where they think that means it's undefined or something like that. That's not what that means. It just means that that limit is going to zero. All right, example eight. I'm going to bring that e to the n to the denominator. So this gives me n squared over e to the n, which again is infinity over infinity. I'm going to let f of x equal x squared over e to the x. And I'm going to have to apply L'Hopital's twice. I'm guessing. So I'm going to apply L'Hopital's. Now, this is still infinity over infinity. So I, that means I can apply L'Hopital's a second time. This is now two over infinity. And this entire thing limit goes to zero. And once again, we would say that it's therefore 
the limit as n approaches infinity of n squared e to the negative n is also zero, which is convergent. So determine whether the sequence a sub n equals negative one to the n is convergent or divergent. Well, let's write out some of the terms. Let's do this one a little bit differently. A sub one is gonna be negative one. A sub two is gonna be positive one because negative one squared is a positive. A sub three, negative one to an odd number is gonna be negative one. A sub four equals one. And this will continue forever and ever. So the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n is plus or minus one. So this is definitely divergent. Because it's bits. The limit is going to two different values. All right, we're getting there. A few more to go. Determine if this limit exists. Now, what we did, there was a theorem on the first page, second page, that says if this limit with absolute value goes to zero, then the original function uh, limit also goes to zero. We're gonna apply that here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value. Absolute value. Now, what that's gonna do is that's gonna kill that negative one to the n. It's just gonna turn it always into a positive one because it's absolute value all the time. The denominator is also always positive. So this becomes the limit as n approaches infinity of one over two root n. What's cool about this is once again, this limit goes to zero. Therefore the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n over two root n is also zero. Again, which is convergent. Number 11, actually this one's very simple. This limit here goes to zero. And what's the sign of zero? It's zero. So this one is also convergent. All right, this next one is a little messy. I'm gonna actually use some extra space here. So this one, I'm going to let f of x Right now it's um, infinity times zero. And actually before I do that, let me show you how far, where I'm thinking. I'm gonna bring that n down to the denominator and it becomes this. Notice we're using the rule where um, if you're dividing by a fraction, you end up multiplying by the reciprocal. And I'm actually going backwards with that rule. And this gives us zero over zero, which is one of our L'Hopital potentials. So I'm going to let f of x equal function the sine of one over x over one over x. So our limit as x approaches infinity of sine of one over x over one over x is actually zero over zero. So let's apply L'Hopital's. This is gonna give us cosine of one over x 
times the derivative of that, that becomes a negative one over x squared. And the derivative of that is negative one over x squared. We will note those reduce out completely. So what is the limit as x goes to infinity there? Well, that's gonna make that whole part there go to zero. And what's the cosine of zero? One. Therefore, we can conclude the limit as n approaches infinity of n sine of one over n is equal to one, which once again is convergent. But this next rule, the sequence r to the n is convergent when r is between negative one and one. And it's convergent specifically, so you can see one to any power. So if r is one, one to any power is just one. So that, that's where that's coming from. However, if r is between negative one and one, so let's pick one half. So if I take one half to the n power and I shove n off to infinity, watch what happens. I'm gonna take 0.5 raised to the third power, 0.5 raised to the 10th power. You can see how small that's getting. That's 0 0.000976 and so on. So if I take 0.5 raised to the uh, 40th power, you can see how small that's getting. So if we do 0.5 raised to the, let's say 80th power, 0.5, so that, that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can see it's just gonna get closer and closer and closer to zero. So that's where those limits go to zero. However, if I go the other way, take three to the n power, something that's not between negative one and one. Well, three to the fourth power is 81. Three to the 10th power is 59,049. And you can see this is going up to infinity. So that's why it only converges when r is between negative one and one, including one. And it specifically goes, uh, the, the limit goes to when we're between negative one and one goes to zero. And when it's exactly one, it goes to one. Otherwise it diverges, meaning off to infinity, most likely. All right, let's talk about increasing and decreasing just shortly with sequences. So, a sequence is increasing if every term as it goes in order gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the previous term is always smaller than the, than the upcoming term and so on. Yeah, just like, just like we have here. It's decreasing if it's the other way around. If each next one is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, I wanna point out for this one that the denominator is always going to be bigger than the numerator in this case, every time, because the numerator is just n, the denominator is n squared. So I'm gonna square that number and then add one to it. And as the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the whole thing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's why this is decreasing. We're gonna have lots more examples of that uh, later in, in this chapter. All right.